happens, which is great. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. We appreciate that. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Early Learning Advisory Council Executive Session. Uh, today, of course, is May 9th. And as you're all aware, this is a report development session. So something a little new, a little different, unless you were participating in the temporary licensing subcommittee process. Um, here's a few virtual meeting protocols. Of course, you're probably all very aware of um, how this works. Should you have a question, um, it would be helpful if you raised your hand. That way we have a chance to um, grab you or the presenter has a chance to ask your question. Um, we'll make sure and do our best to get to everybody as, as you have questions. And uh, throughout the meeting, please mute yourself if you can. And at the end, we'll get into a lot of Q&A. So there should be lots of opportunities to um, get some information from today. And welcome, Emily. I saw you sneak in. Glad to have you. And if Hi. You, hi there. Uh, if you have any questions or technical difficulties, uh, of course, you can reach us in the chat box or you can send us an email to the one listed below. And I'm sure Jess or somebody can get back to you quickly that way. Thank you. Okay, so um, we do have about 15 minutes or so until Nicole is going to be here for a presentation. So we have a little time to uh, to fill. And what I'd like to do is, since we do have the time, why don't we do this verbally? Um, for those that are comfortable with sharing your name, where you're located, um, you may do so verbally, or if you're more comfortable um, doing that in chat, that is fine. So how about, Emily, you're the first on my screen. You might be new to the group. Um, maybe if you could introduce yourself where you're located. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I'm trying to come off camera. I'm not sure. If, uh, I'm still learning Zoom, so forgive you're me. You're fine. Um, so my name is Emily Grossman, and I'm the new deputy for community engagement at DCYF. I've been on the job for about three weeks, and I came from the Department of Commerce, where um, I did a lot of community engagement work around housing and homelessness and poverty reduction and digital equity and a bunch of other stuff. So I'm really excited to uh, join DCYF and work with you all. And um, thanks for having me. Thank you, Emily. How about I will kick it over to Lisa and then Lisa after that, if you'd like to um, grab someone and ask them to introduce yourself, that'd be great and until we have a chance to get through everybody. So uh, Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Callen. I am a state representative that's pointed uh, to ELAC and I'm excited to be here, be out of session and get to join you. I don't get to do that during session, so it's always nice um, to see you all. I represent the 5th Legislative District which starts in Issaquah and goes to Tapasnogwamie Pass um, and is just north of I-90 and goes to just north of Enumclaw. So a uh, big swath of uh, um, rural and um, touch of urban on, in the mix of the district. And I serve as vice chair of capital. I serve on the um, K-12 uh, education committee and also on human services early learning. And I'd like to toss it over to Emily. Good morning, I'm Emily Morgan. I am on the DCYF community engagement team. Um, I am in Spokane and uh, my role is community engagement manager, um, but I'm here with you all today to help you help facilitate you developing recommendations for um, the recommendation report. And I see Samantha Masters next. Oh, also my pronouns are she, her. Hello, I'm Samantha Masters, um, and I am the Early Learning Program Manager at Children's Home Society of Washington in Spokane, but I'm also on the Home Visiting Advisory Committee, and here I'm representing that, uh, the HVAC, and I think that was it. How about Nancy? Hello, I'm uh, Nancy Spurgeon, and I am the uh, Regional Advisor for North Central Washington's Early Learning Coalition, at, which is part of the Washington Communities for Children Coalitions. 
And I will pass it on to someone who doesn't have their camera on. I'll pass it on to Jessica Spencer. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Jessica Spencer, I'm on the community engagement team and I am in um, Tri-Cities, Richland, Washington. And I will pass it to um, uh, uh, Jamie, if you haven't already gone. Hi, I am Jamie McLaughlin. Sorry to be camera off this morning. Uh, I am the King County Early Learning Coalition's policy and advocacy lead, as well as the Bright Sparks mobilization coordinator. Uh, thanks for having me. I will go ahead and call on uh, Michelle if she has not gone already. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Perez. She, her pronouns. I'm the workforce equity learning partner at the city of Seattle, former quality recognition specialist for early achievers. And I will pass it on to um, who hasn't gone? Debbie Carlson, have you gone? I think Debbie did her intro in the in the chat. Yeah, uh, how, if that's okay. That that's oh, right. absolutely. You betcha. Uh, how about myself? Since I'm hogging up the space here, uh, my name is Eric Lafontaine. I use he/him pronouns. I am on the community engagement team as a manager here with DCYF, and I am here to help facilitate this great conversation. And uh, Senator Wilson, we had a chance to introduce you. Sorry, a few minutes late, Senator Wilson. Um, we're representing the 30th Legislative District, but also Vice Chair of Early Learning K-12 um, in the Senate. Happy to be here this morning. I have no idea who has not gone or who shall go next. So I'm going to let somebody else help me out on that one. How about I'll help you? How about Enrica? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Enrica Hampton, she, her pronouns, and I serve as the um, uh, regional advisor um, uh, representing the King County Early Learning Coalition. Um, and uh, Eric, I will need your help to figure out who has not gone. You betcha. Uh, Valissa, I believe you might be up next. Sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm Belisa Smith, yes. and I'm with Start Early Washington, and we're the state chapter of um, the National Start Early organization, and we do a lot of work supporting specifically home visiting programs, as well as advocate for kids and families across the state. Um, and I'm not sure, Nicole, have you gone? Not. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole Rose, Assistant Secretary of Early Learning at the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. I use she, her pronouns. I am in Olympia, and I am happy to be with you today to talk about um, the great things that we've accomplished and will continue to do with Fair Start for Kids Act when we get there. And I also am not sure everyone who has gone. So Emily or Eric, if you could help with that, that would you be You bet. Um, I know, Kathy, have you had a chance? I have not. Oh my gosh. Hi, my name is Kathy guess. Carmen. Thank you. I'm Kathy Carmen, and I am a center owner um, in the Arlington and Marysville area, of it, technically Smoky Point, North Snohomish County. And I'm also the um, president of the WCCA, um, Washington Child Care Centers Association, and I'm here on, on representing the child care centers. Thank you so much, Kathy. I think I saw Erin sneak in and she might be the last. Erin, if, if you have your audio ready, we'd love to hear you introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Erin. I am uh, the community engagement administrator on the team and I'm just popping in to observe today. Okay, I think we did it. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. Um, welcome. It's it's great for you all to take the time and and spend maybe three hours here uh, having a fantastic conversation on a topic that I'm sure some of you are very familiar with, and uh, maybe some of you might not be real familiar with. And so this will be a great opportunity um, to get some education for both of those. Um, before we dive in, I'd like to just lay out the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to begin with a presentation. 
on the Fair Start for Kids Act. Uh, it will be um, a more of a general overall update. Um, and after that, we will take a break. We expect Nicole's presentation maybe an hour or so, but could go a little longer depending on, on conversations and questions, um, or shorter maybe. Uh, and, and then we'll take a quick little break, um, followed by the second half of today's session, which is where we're going to really get into the report development side of all of this. Uh, and later on today, Emily will Emily Morgan will actually be leading that work and that discussion. Uh, and then with that, I guess we could you no know, worries of, of not getting started a few minutes early. Does anyone have any questions before we begin or anything to share with the group? Okay. I think that means everyone's excited. Um, well, Nicole, uh, I'd like to introduce Assistant Secretary of Early Learning, Nicole Rose. Nicole is here to talk to us. Um, on the Fair Start for Kids Act and DCYF's spending goals and strategies that have been called out in the legislation. And I do believe, um, Jess, you were able to put the presentation up for Nicole. Very good. Okay, with that, welcome, Nicole. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you all. And thanks again for having me here today. And um, I just want to take a moment and reflect on, um, again, one of the most historic landmark investments we have seen from the state legislature in early learning, and um, just thank Senator Wilson and Representative Callen for that. And, you know, as I reflect on what uh, we were able to put out, um, a lot of this came from conversations over the last several years, and I think is a true testament to when providers and others are speaking up, um, that you really are heard and you, you saw that reflected in this legislation. And so um, the other thing I'll note is while I am here talking with you today, um, there is an entire team in our early learning division um, who has been really integral in implementing these strategies, as well as conversations with ELAC and provider supports and others. And so I am going to go over sort of what we aim to do what we've accomplished and a little bit about sort of what's ahead. Um, and I might at the end talk a little bit about even what's ahead as we think about some of our decision packages and work in the interim, because all of that is really aligned to some of these foundational um, strategies that were put forth in the Fair Start for Kids Act. So as I go along, um, feel free to put questions in the chat. And I can um, either address them as we go, or if I think I'm going to get to that in a moment, um, I'll let you know that as well. So if we want to go to the next slide. So this just is showing you a little bit about what we are going to cover today, um, the how you can help. You're already doing all of that by being here, and there'll certainly be some time for discussion. On the next slide. Um, this really just sets the vision for our department. And I think, again, as we think about the investments in the early learning space from the Fair Start for Kids Act, it really is supporting um, all of Washington's children and youth. And we're really thinking about that emotional, physical, academic um, safety and high quality space, not only for kids, but their families and community. We know kids um, and families aren't in existence without sort of that community piece. I think the other thing I'll note is while we think about children and families as at the center of what we're doing, you'll see in the investments in the act that there is a lot of acknowledgement around what is it providers need to support the kids and families that are coming through their doors. So if we wanna go to the next slide. So there were multiple investments in this act from childcare to state funded pre-K to some of our informal settings as well, including home visiting. And we really looked at um, this continuum of services that we're providing to try and reach all of Washington's children and families. And we know at the same time um, that we're reaching a small portion of them. And this continues to get us to increasing that accessibility and availability of services. So we'll talk a little bit more in depth today about child care in particular, around some of the levers we have around co-pays, um, eligibility, 
some resources and supports that went to family, friend, and neighbor providers, talk a little bit about what we've done in state-funded pre-K, and then um, just an acknowledgement that there was some expansion in home visiting as well. And so, um, again, that whole continuum from your formal to some of your informal settings. So if we want to go to the next slide. So I just talked a little bit about the fact that we've got some big need here. The following slide is going to show us some numbers. So if you want to go to that next one um, around the number of children and families that are served and then really who is eligible for care. And one of the things that I think that's important about um, looking at some of these numbers is that um, we really focus in often on that birth through five space, which is really important. And one of the things I like to highlight as we do this work is that we have a pretty large school age population um, as we think about our families that are on accessing subsidy as well. And so we wanna be mindful of how are we making all of those investments up front in those earliest years? And then as we think about subsidy and some of those other activities in particular, how are we focusing in on that school age piece as well? So you've got some numbers here. And, and what I would say as you look at these numbers is that we're serving um, a small percentage of the population in our formal setting. So we've got an opportunity to be able to do more. And you hear from families and providers um, around why that's important and why we want to continue to think about expanding some of those populations that are eligible for subsidy. So if we go to the next slide, um, we know that access to care is a huge challenge and it is a challenge in fact for our child care providers who are providing care as well and there was some recognition of that during this last session um, as we think about um, continuing to expand eligibility for um, child care providers who are providing great care to our kids and families. So we know costs are high. They're one of the biggest challenges along with food and housing. Um, child care costs can cost more than college tuition. Um, I thought I was outside of that, those pieces. And now that I'm thinking about college tuition, I can see how it all comes back around, right? And so we're we've got pretty big costs on, on both ends of our kids' lives, that early learning spot and that, that um, secondary education piece. And that can be stressful. It can cause a lot of anxiety and stress. What am I gonna be able to pay for? How am I gonna choose to pay for that? And we also know that families really want um, a nurturing environment and well-trained staff. And I know that when my kids were in childcare, that that was really important to me. And that was important to me, whether they were in a licensed family home or whether they were in a childcare center. And so we want to think about as families are making those choices, again, how do we make sure that there is choice for families and how do we make sure that providers have the resources that they need to provide that care? So on the next slide, you really see um, the focus here. We're going to focus in on families, we focus in on kids, and we focus in on providers. And so as we go through the things that we have accomplished, um, you'll see that theme continue to be highlighted throughout our conversation this morning. Okay, so if we want to go to the next one. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the solution and the things that the Fair Start for Kids Act funded. And so the following slide is around um, improving affordability. And so as we think about affordability, there are um, some levers that we had around co-pays. One of the things that was happening previous to the Fair Start for Kids Act is that families may have been eligible for subsidy, but because their co-pays were so high that it wasn't beneficial to them. So prior to the Fair Start for Kids Act, we sometimes had families paying a co-payment of upwards of 19 or 20 percent of their income. And that was forcing some families to make choices about do I continue to work? Do I can do I am I able to pay my co-pay? Um, am I going to be able to pay rent this month? And so is we think about the affordability piece, the capping of the co-pays um, really allowed us then to think about how we could increase eligibility, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But that co-payment cap had to happen first before we could increase um, who was actually eligible for care. 
And so literally what we have is a family of four pays no more than $115 a month in co-pays if they have a combined income of $64,000 or less per year. And then that same family will pay no more than $90 a month if their combined income was less than $53,544 a year. And we've moved from federal poverty level to state median income, which we think is a bit more reflective of what is happening in our state um, as we think about eligibility. Um, and so know that those income levels change every year um, as we get updated state median income numbers. So I talked about we had to improve affordability before we could look at um, accessibility. And because we were able to um, cap those co-pays and make that move from federal poverty level to state median income um, and look at some of that across ECAP and home visiting, the next slide shows how we've been able to improve accessibility in the past um, couple of years. So we have had 82 more hundred families eligible to access subsidy through Working Connections Child Care. Um, we were able to add over a thousand new pre-K slots through ECAP, and then we have another 185 additional families that are served through seven home visiting programs across the state. And these are numbers that really go from the 21 to 23 year. So I'll talk about what's coming in the future here in a little bit. But these are some pretty big accomplishments, um, given that we had seen some declining caseloads in working connections. And so being able to see that go up, I think, is really powerful. Um, and we always want to be thinking about how we can serve more families. So we're, we are making steps to do that. Um, that being said, um, we know as we center on kids and families that we want to make sure that things are um, adequately resourced. And in the last couple of years, we also really needed to think about how do we stabilize our providers in what we already know is a broken child care market and economy. And so if we go to the next slide, talk a little bit about the ways that we're um, able to stabilize providers and um, ways that we're thinking about um, how does that translate into the resources needed to move forward. I wanna acknowledge um, as I'm talking about these stabilization dollars that we um, hear from providers about the need that is still out there. And so these are steps that we're taking to make some investments. Um, and acknowledge that there are some things that we're going to be doing in the next couple of years um, that we think will be helpful, such as moving to the true cost of care versus the market rate survey. But um, since 2021, we were able to invest 300 and over $360 million in stabilization funding for providers that continue to keep their doors open during the pandemic and serve children and families. And um, that was a pretty historic investment um, and was above and beyond um, what had happened in the previous years prior. So there had been um, some stabilization efforts that had started and a real recognition that those stabilization efforts needed to continue with the passage of the Fair Start for Kids Act. We also heard a lot about access to health care. And so we're able to partner with the Washington Benefits Health Exchange to um, provide some assistance so that there was no monthly premium to access health care for providers. One of the things that we found as providers were calling in and working with the navigators is that sometimes they were eligible for some of the other programs that were out there, but we had over 652 providers that enrolled in the uh, no cost monthly premium um, in partnership with the Washington Health Benefits Exchange. And we know that um, the navigators and others were successful in um, making that happen. I know I'm kind of jumping around the slide here, um, but part of that's because I want to talk about things that were happening um, to really uh, stabilize and then sort of what is it that has happened um, to make that base a little bit stronger as we think about funding. One of the things that we learned over the several rounds of grant funding that had happened prior to the stabilization grants was really the need for technical assistance. And we're really um, thankful 
for um, the acknowledgement of that in the Fair Start for Kids Act and the budget bills that passed to really say it's important to invest in technical assistance for providers as you're thinking about grants and dollars that are going out the door. And so we were able to um, do that and did over 9,000 technical assistance sessions for providers across our various grants and did that in 29 different languages. So those were some of the stabilization pieces. And then um, thinking about how do we then take that and continue to put money back into sort of what I would say sort of the base services or base subsidies. There was the 16% rate enhancement to licensed center providers through working connections, and then a 10% increase in the um, ECAP rate for providers. One of the things that we also heard a lot about is um, the need for mental health consultation. And you saw that show up in a variety of ways, but in, in this one, really what we focused in on was there was a doubling of the available, available funding for mental health consultation for providers. And so that allowed us to go up to 15 mental health consultants, um, infant and early childhood mental health consultants across the state of Washington. I'm just looking at Lois's question. So any movement to the income being based on area median income instead of federal poverty level to access health insurance because sometimes staff are turning down raises to stay eligible or don't qualify even if their wage is a thriving one. You know, that is a great question, Lois, and one that we can pose to our partners at the Washington Health Benefits Exchange. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I know um, I've heard uh, a couple of places where people want to think about area median income um, for child care as well, um, but we'll be sure to follow up on that one. And I think that does become the challenge, right? So I get a raise and it should be great, but does that raise mean I'm no longer some eligible for something that's really important and my raise doesn't make it so that um, I can actually take on the cost of that. So I will, we'll take that as a follow-up with the health benefits exchange. Okay, so um, I'm gonna dive deeper into some more supports for families in a little bit, or I'm sorry, more supports for providers in a little bit. I wanna talk a little bit about supporting families and if we can go to the next slide. So this is just diving a little bit deeper into some of the things that were um, done to support families. Uh, we saw an increase in access for student parents. Um, so as we looked at sort of broadening that definition of what was allowable in activities for parents going to school, we were able to increase access there. Um, we've expanded eligibility for tribal children to access ECAP. One of the things I'll note is that we are we have a working definition of that right now and are doing a lot of work with the Office of Tribal Relations um, and are doing some stakeholder and tribal work around what will the definition of Indian child be for ECAP as we move into the future. We're also, um, for the first time ever, um, had grants that went to family, friends, and neighbor providers who provide care for their um, families, friends, or relatives. And so that was something that was um, done to support the families that were making some different choices about the care that they wanted to access over the last couple of years. And then we're just continuing to look at our um, early achievers, quality recognition and improvement standards, um, and think about ways in which those continue to be accessible for families um, to understand the quality of the provider that they are going to. And on early achievers, um, I know that they have come to ELAC and provider supports and talked about some of that work, but the last couple of years really provided us an opportunity to have conversations with a broader group of providers based on feedback we've received over the years, really use a racial equity and anti-racist lens um, as we were thinking about sort of what the next phase of early achievers looks like. 
Okay, so if we go on to talk a little bit about some of the um, quality elements, we have had some investments um, that are doing a variety of things, all really in this cluster of trauma-informed mental health pieces, um, inclusive environments, um, and inclusive in a variety of ways. So being culturally responsive, really recognizing that kids and families are coming through um, our doors, children in particular, sometimes with some more complex needs and um, making sure that there are support, some supports um, directly in the classroom for that. And then thinking about what is our trauma-informed care work. And so um, we have granted more than $1.7 million and that's really in the equity grants bucket as we're thinking about what are the culturally responsive learning environments that providers are offering. We have a trauma-informed care manager to work with partners across DCYF. And I think this is a place where it's really important to highlight um, as an agency, when we are getting investments and we have the opportunity to do things like trauma-informed care work, um, that we're really thinking about how do we talk about that across the entire agency? So while we have a trauma-informed care manager who's, who has come on to help us think about what that looks like in the early learning space, um, that manager is actually pulling together a group across child welfare and juvenile rehabilitation to think about what are our trauma-informed practices across the entire system. Um, sometimes we may have families who are, we know we have families who are in ECAP and may be um, involved in out-of-home placement and some of those um, other services that we offer. And so really trying to think holistically about the work that we're doing at the agency. And as I shared before, we were able to increase the number of infant and early childhood mental health consultants. Uh, we still see waiting lists uh, in providers that want to access infant and early childhood mental health consultants, but we are continuing to grow that work. And that work is done in partnership with Child Care Aware. So I'm just going to pause there because I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking at <laughs> and make space. Um, to see if there are any questions, um, thoughts that are coming to mind before I do a little bit of a deeper dive into our child care stabilization grant work. Hi, Nicole. This is ECs from Launch. Um, I just had a clarifying question because I only caught the end of it. Actually, I have two questions. Um, if you can go back to the last slide. So, okay, so adding six new consultants specializing in infant and early childhood mental health. What's the age range? Is that birth to 12 or is that birth to five? Really focused on birth to five birth to five and, and why is that again that is focused on birth to five because that is tied to um, participation in early achievers which at this point in time uh, really has a birth to five component although with the um, updated video highlights that providers can send in there is a school age component as well i'm sorry can you repeat that last part there's a school age component in what? So the, the infant and early childhood mental health consultants is tied to participation in early achievers, which is yeah. really focused on birth to five. There is a, a recognition in the updated um, early achievers quality recognition process around school age care, but infant and early childhood mental health consultation is tied to those programs that are serving birth to five at this point in time. Okay, gotcha. And then, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned something about, um, I think there was a, a, a gap that of kids eligible and how many are served and that we should um, uh, hone in on that part of that, part of those eligible are school age that was in the, 
Yeah. Can you just repeat, the, repeat that first part for me of the presentation, I think. Yeah, the, absolutely. Thank so you. there, there is a, I would say that there is a gap in supply and demand, right? So there's a gap in those that are eligible and those that are being served. One of the things that I think that it's important to know when we think about Working Connections child care is that about 40% of the children receiving Working Connections child care are school age children. So it's really important that we are investing in birth to five and we need to think about what are the things that we're doing um, that are supporting school age as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Nicole, Debbie has a question in the chat. Uh, where will the BH consultants be located in Washington State? Yeah, so the infant and early childhood mental health consultants are um, hired by the regional child care aware offices, and so they are located across the state in our regional child care aware offices. And then we do have the trauma informed care manager at the Department of Children, Youth and Families. And so um, if there are more specifics you're wanting to know about that, um, just let me know sort of what you're looking for there, Debbie. Has the person already been hired? Yeah, they've been on board for some time now. Okay. Um, I'm looking for examples of how of this professional and what, how things have been changing within DCYF based on their recommendations. Just trying to get a sense of what that means, essentially. Sure. And so some of that is resources and supports that are rolling out to providers. And then we do have a trauma informed care work group. So I'm happy to provide some follow up information on that. Okay, thank you. And Kathy, I'm going to um, get you the exact data source from where those numbers came from on that slide. Uh, it looks like Enrica, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you, Eric. Um, I'm just in looking at the um, slide where it's talking about that um, the money um, that's going towards supporting the inclusive environments for children with developmental delays, disabilities, and behavioral needs. I was wondering if you could um, provide uh, some examples of how that is um, how that's looking on the on the ground um, in a different um, in different parts of of the state. Yeah, and so thanks for the question, Erika. And all of that went out through our complex needs fund. Um, and what we really saw was a lot of the resources for that were our biggest requests were around staffing. And I can um, get the fast facts for that and put that in the chat. I know that we really had to prioritize applications. And so um, they prioritized applications from providers located in childcare deserts. Um, but the biggest things I know that we really saw were staffing and access to um, adaptive materials. But let me uh, get you, get the updated um, fast facts on that and drop it in the chat for you. Great, thank you. And with the staffing, and I'll take a look at look at the document that you're going to share. Does that also speak to? So it's one thing to add staffing, but is it actually resulting in um, uh, programs being better able to um, include children with developmental delays, disabilities, behavioral needs, or do you not have that level of data at this time? We do not have that level of data at this time. So the um, first and second rounds of those just closed in November. And I do not believe we have, have started receiving um, reports on that yet, but let me double check on that. Okay, thank you. I was gonna ask 
also, is there some type of documentation um, in a similar vein around the impact of bringing on a trauma-informed professional to DCYS, DCYF? Yeah, so we have um, the Holding Hope reporting that comes from Child Care Aware, um, and I can follow up on some of the larger cross-agency work that we're doing. I think one of the things as I'm reflecting on um, the questions that you all are asking is um, thinking about just the relative time that has passed, which is a short period of time, and how we tell the story of that. And I think as we think about um, the report and I go back to my team, I want to think about how we can get more information out there about the impacts that we're seeing. Any other questions? Okay. So I think we will go on and I'm gonna work to try and get you some of this information um, as you are together today. So this is just putting in some more detail. The number of grants that were awarded and to whom as we looked at the child care stabilization grant. And so you can see the number of licensed and certified providers and the number of family friend and neighbor providers. And then if they were an ECAP licensed site, they were also eligible to receive these funds. And so this is just showing um, the breakdown of what that looks like. The Early Childhood Equity Grant is the next slide, and it is um, showing the number of applications that we received. Um, one of the things that I would say as we move into the Early Childhood Equity Grant and the Complex Needs Fund is that the, the Child Care Stabilization Grant was meant to really stabilize and think about all those providers that were open and um, providing care. When we moved into the early childhood equity grants and the child care complex needs funds, um, those dollars um, had some more specific criteria. And um, because of the need that was out there really were more of what we would consider a competitive grant meaning not everybody who applied was going to be able to access this. And so one of the things you'll see is that um, for early childhood equity grants, I talked about the $1.7 million that went out in that first round, we had applications totaling over $100 million. So you really see a need and a desire to really think about how do I support this in my program. In the second round that will be released soon, we went through a refinement process with um, community stakeholders and other partners to say, what worked well about this grant? What do we need to do and think differently around the Early Childhood Equity Grant? Um, and so really taking that refinement and um, implementing that in round two. And I'm gonna drop in the chat a link to the refinement document that talks about uh, what changes were made and why the change was made um, as we went through this um, next round of grant criteria. And that included changes from sort of who was prioritized, um, making sure that there was a grant readiness checklist, providers asked for that, um, and looking at the categories around the outcomes and changing budget categories. And then also um, asked us to really look at the minimum amount of grants. And so while we might not always get it right, um, we're really trying to take time and go back. And when we hear feedback and talk with providers around what would make this next round of grants or whatever it is we're implementing better, um, and really trying to increase transparency around the feedback that we can take, uh, why we can take it, or if we can't take it, why we can't take it. So we feel like the 
early childhood equity grant um, is a good example of that. So we are, we are learning as we go um, and really trying to adjust as we go as well. So if we wanna go to the next slide. I have a quick question just in reading the document quickly. Is there any tracking of providers who are providing services to families um, that are with foster children within the foster care children or system? So we know who is, so there's a couple of different ways. We know who is receiving child welfare, child care payments. Um, but other than that, we might not know unless a provider reports to us in some of these grants um, if they are serving a child who is in out of home placement or involved in the system. Um, so one of the things, Debbie, that I would say about that is that what we have at the department, unless the child is receiving subsidy, we know the capacity of the provider, but we do not have actual enrollment data at licensed centers or family homes. So we don't track down to the child level unless they're actually receiving subsidy. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, complex needs. This was another space where we really uh, heard and saw a lot of need. And um, this was a place where we were able to go back um, and ask if we could use some, some dollars to put some more funding into child care complex needs. Um, you can see again here that in that first round, we had requests for over $87 million. In the second round, you see another increase in the request with requests for over $149 million. And we're um, extremely thankful that during this last legislative session, there was an increase in equity grants in child care complex needs. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that there was also an increase in um, the ECAP complex needs as well. And so in the ECAP complex needs, again, this is going directly to the contractor. Um, but you're seeing that the requests that they are having, again, we're outstripping um, the dollars that were available. And so there were some increase made in the ECAP complex need arena as well. Nicole, Isis has a quick question in yep. the chat. Yeah, and that is coming probably in the next little bit here. And so I'm going to verify that date. I believe we just put something out saying it was um, coming soon. So it should be sometime this spring. And so I'm going to see if we can get closer on that date for you. Okay, so one of the... So one of the things I just wanna say as we move into sort of what's coming ahead is that um, huge, huge, huge accomplishments and, and wins and dollars going out to providers. And you see sort of the, how do we think about um, what this means moving forward? And how do we think about what are the rates? What do those need to be? Um, moving forward. And that's where we, I think, have a real opportunity with the cost of care work. So I'll talk a little bit about what to expect in 2023-25 on the following slide. So as we um, go into the next biennium, there are additional slots that we will be adding through ECAP. And so there'll be 500 slots added in each of the next school years in ECAP, as well as converting a um, thousand slots per year from part day to school day, because we know that dosage matters. And so um, we're excited to be doing that. Our trauma-informed care awards are being rolled out right now. Um, I'll tell you what those acronyms are. So ECAP is our Early Childhood Education and Assistance Program. And then WGQR is our Workforce Growth and Quality Recognition Unit in the Early Learning Division. 
Um, and we're working to get all of those trauma-informed care awards out through ECAP contracts, or if you're a licensed child care provider through Child Care Aware. We have the dual language designation fund that is open, and that is available for providers who are doing um, early, who are participating in early achievers. And so there is a process by which to submit that, and your early achievers coach can help you with that. And then we're continuing to expand Eclipse, which is our therapeutic child care and specialized treatment. Um, and it is really something that we are layering on top of our ECAP services to provide some support to those most in need. We want to go to the next slide. So we have the additional early childhood equity grants that are opening. Um, and or the equity grants that are coming soon. And then we have the additional funding that we, we received in 23-25. So um, we had the $5.2 million per fiscal year for early childhood equity grants, which we're really excited about. We had additional complex needs grant funding for child care providers for about 9.7 million awarded per fiscal year. And so that is also great. And then in ECAP, there will be an additional um, two and a half million in complex needs for fiscal year 24 and 3.28 million in fiscal year 25. You know, as we look at all of these different grants and awards, um, and we had an increase um, in the child care subsidy rates to the 2021 market rate survey, which is a huge investment for our child care providers, we had a rate increased um, varying anywhere from, I think, 9 to 18% for state-funded pre-K, depending upon the model and type of slot that the provider is offering. I think there's, again, true acknowledgement of what it costs to provide care. And so there's some really important work that we're going to be doing during the interim where we want to look at some of the questions that you're asking. What's, what's the impact we're seeing on the ground? Where are the biggest places we're seeing um, requests around funding and complex needs? And how do we think about what really is that true cost of providing high quality care? And there's work that we're doing uh, with a design team to really come up with how do we put forth a model around the true cost of high quality care to the legislature. There's also work around a child care access and living wage proviso. So um, lots of interest in how do we really take a look at the child care market as a whole. And I really think about it as an opportunity for us to think about um, not just how the system works today, but how do we want the system to work in the future? And how do we really think about um, expanding access and affordability and keeping that eye to high quality care? So lots of really good things that are happening that Fair Start for Kids Act really sets the foundation for. And then some great investments that have passed at this time. And um, equity grant is scheduled to open tomorrow. And so that, so take a look out for that. And then um, I did double check and we just closed the first reporting timeline for complex needs. So we're just going through um, those results to look at um, what we're hearing and we'll be able to report back out on that. And thanks, Belisa, for putting that in there. Lots of new early learning investments. So with that, I will just say um, really, really powerful um, to hear from parents and families where things have made a difference for them. And this is just a quote from Jessica Huebner about the impact that the Fair Start for Kids Act has made um, in their life. Um, just as legislative session is ending, we're always thinking about next session. And so we're already thinking about what does it mean for us as we go into a supplemental session? And, um, you know, I would ask Senator Wilson or Rep Callum if there's anything you want to say about 
supplemental or any of this, but we know that there have been so many investments that have been made and also acknowledge that we want to continue to look at that ECAP slot rate and continue to look at childcare as a whole um, moving forward as we implement some of the things from this session as well and have an eye to the next big session where we'll really get into cost of quality in those pieces. I, I might just add, Nicole, uh, a couple of thoughts came to mind. One is, you know, the work around DD and ID um, population, and that sits sometimes in early learning K-12, but it also sits in the sphere of human services, which I chair. So when I think about child welfare and the questions around um, our kids that are system impacted, that's very much a bigger picture um, than just early learning. So it's part of uh, the pie. And it's and for me, I look at it at both sides, how we're serving an early learning K-12, but also what does that look like for our wraparound services and supports? So that's critically important. Uh, school age care is another one as we think about that. Again, it's all prevention. And we traditionally in early learning have thought about birth to five, but our definition of early learning in our state is prenatal to grade three or age eight. So it crosses the system and sectors. And as we think about what's happened in the pandemic, finally others have understood uh, that it is not just about what happens before the kindergarten door, but also how families need support after that, and that these are no longer just poverty programs, which is what they were created to do. And then the last thing I would just say um, related to supports for providers is the uh, early learning facilities funds, which um, Nicole didn't have a chance to speak on, but that really is around facilities and the need not only for new facilities and siting of facilities, but also renovations and, um, and changes to current facilities that also answers the question of how we're doing more inclusive uh, work and how we're doing universal design for learning and how we're thinking about that uh, pre-kindergarten. So um, a lot of money, not only for the dollars, but also for supports um, for uh, individuals who were awarded grants to help them through the process of permitting and design and all those things that uh, we know way more about kids often than we do about buildings. And so how is it that we're successful in the dollars we do get to leverage those? So those would be just a couple other additional things. And again, our systems were never meant to get people out of them. They were meant to keep people right where they are. And so much of the disruption is trying to give people what they need to lift up and out. And that's our providers as well as um, those that are participating in our programs. And so, um, and have absolutely valued the work um, with Rep. Callen in the house on all things kids and families um, from prenatal through, because I think that is our most important work and also our most expensive work. My mantra this session, humans cost a lot of money. I would like to just add, you know, from uh, as vice chair of capital budgets, working really hard to make sure that we're doing historic investments in early learning facilities. Um, so this year we were able to put $70 million towards early learning facilities grants, which is just fabulous. Um, and uh, many of those are targeted projects to try to build out um, deserts as well as uh, build out the equity of who we're serving. Um, and in particular, uh, there will be 42 million specifically for grants and this for this biennium I want to make sure the words getting out that we've increased the cap just for a one time biennium increase. Um, I believe it's to 2.5 million normally it's a $1 million grant cap but um, we've increased that. So if you know of anybody that is interested in trying to get into this next round of um, financing and, and just make sure that they're uh, recognizing and knowing the increase in the, the cap availability for delivery of funds, that's huge. And then if anybody has any questions, always feel free to reach out to me specifically on the capital stuff. I like to dive deep in that space. Yeah, and we are excited about the Early Learning Facilities Fund. And um, just so folks know, that is a partnership with Commerce. Um, and one of the things that we're really looking at as we think about those investments that you all were talking about is what is the technical assistance even needed when applying for the grant? And then as Senator Wilson talked about, once they have the money. So we're doing some looking and thinking there as well around what are some of the 
uh, resources that we need to put in yeah. there with an eye to language access also and making sure that it is culturally relevant and responsive TA uh, on things that are complex, um, you know, CDFI and <laughs> those types of things are in <laughs> architecture and not the world I live in. And so, and yeah. So for this I was just going to say, Nicole, three hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars for the cohort project, specifically for award winners of um, the grant project. So, Imagine Institute has been really uh, doing wonderful things at helping people with applications, especially with multiple languages. But once the award was happening, um, again, that's the space, and so we've got three hundred fifty thousand that was put in there to support a cohort model of a group of architects, early learning folks um, that know both environments inside and outside to help uh, through a facilitated collaborative process, which will be really exciting pilot. It was a pilot um, in Pierce County and we're now lifting it up to the state to see again how we help support uh, folks across the state. So it just aligns so well with the work that Rep Callen has done and that capital committee has done to put money toward this. Um, and again, now we need to make sure we leverage every dime um, and make those spaces and places the best we can for kids in our communities. Does anyone else have any questions for Nicole while we have her here? Okay, well, uh, Nicole, thank you. Uh, this has been great. I think that a lot of the participants really gain a depth of information of of all the different ways that that you all have been hard at work with related to this legislation. So um, thank you. And thank you, Senator Wilson, for your hard work. Uh, we're a little short on time. I guess this may be a good opportunity for us to take a quick break. Um, unless anyone would like to add any additional questions. Okay, well, how about we will take a, I think we had a 15 minute break on the agenda. Is that correct? Let me look. It was 10 minutes, but it was 10, 10 minutes to 1030. So we are ahead of schedule. So I think, do, do we want to do 15 or 10 minutes? How's the group feeling? 10? Yeah, let's, let's just do 10 and then we can jump into the discussion. Okay, great. Go. Um, we'll take a 10 minute break and we will see you all back here at 1017. Okay, it is 1017, so we can go ahead and slowly get started in case some people are a little slow to come back from break. Um, for the rest of the meeting, we are going to brainstorm what additional information you guys need to make recommendations, and then um, if there are any initial recommendations that have come to mind, we'll discuss those too. Um, but I wanted to start out to see, is there anybody here who is not a member of ELAC who doesn't uh, get these invites regularly? If so, we want to, if you're willing, we want to have your email address so we can keep you updated on um, when these meetings are happening. So if there is anybody who doesn't get the ELEC invites, please feel free to put your email in the chat or um, you can private message either myself, Eric, or Jessica Spencer, and we'll make sure you're added to um, the distribution list for this uh, FSKA recommendation report. Okay, so I will share my screen then. Can you guys see my screen? 
It's looking a little weird on my end. Oh yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so based on that conversation, a presentation from Nicole, some things that I kind of heard, I heard a question on the um, area median income instead of federal poverty level, and I know Nicole's gonna get back to us on that. Um, but I also kind of heard maybe something that we can discuss is how the public, how you guys think the public should be updated on Fair Start for Kids Act progress. Um, sounds like there's a lot, or not a lot, but there's some reports that aren't, uh, you know, data and reports that aren't quite, quite ready since this legislation is still fairly new. Um, so if anyone has any ideas or recommendations on how, um, how the public should be updated on FSKA, I think that um, is something that might be some good recommendations. Um, also on the question that Lois asked about um, insurance and um, AMI and FPL, uh, I saw your comment, staff sometimes turn down raises to ensure they stay eligible or don't qualify even if their wage is a thriving one, shift income from federal poverty level to area median income. Is that something you'd like to have as a recommendation? I'm not sure if Lois is still here in my... Yep, I'm still here, just okay. had to unmute. And yes, that is definitely a recommendation. Okay. Um, and then um, the other piece too, during our executive call yesterday, um, I did share out about the importance of having a space on maybe the FSKA homepage um where the document is there that shows the progress where people don't have to dig through the elac meeting notes um to be able to see find that update on what's been completed what's in process and where we stand with all the recommendations so i want to make sure that's there so those are actually two Oh, sorry. Can you, what was the last thing you said and how? Where we are okay. on the recommendations, where we are, uh, what's been implement, implemented, what won't be implemented and why, and, um, you know, what the process is. And even maybe even a timeline of folk, even if the department knows, like when, say, um, background check fees, we know that went through, that was something that was recommended. So that could be something that's stamped um, that it's completed, but you know, ongoing because we have to make sure it's included in budget every year, something like that. Okay. Um, and you're talking about the TLS tracker, but I'm assuming also then tracking the recommendations that come out of this report. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All the above. Mm -hmm. So something similar I should have said. So thank you for that clarification. Makes sense, thank you. <clears throat> Add this over to the recommendation. Okay. Are there any other initial recommendations that have, that, that came to mind when you were listening to Nicole's presentation or um, you know between the last ELEC meeting and now? Debbie, go ahead. I was going to recommend it was it was mentioned um, around uh, the efforts around wage equity within the early learning sector. Um, I think my recommendation is to similar to Lois, make it really easy and tease it like tease it out like what is being done um, to to address wage inequity within the early learning sector and what are the steps that have been taken? And if, who's the audience of this, by the way? This, a good question. This report is the actual legislation says, provide recommendations annually to the governor and the legislator. So the audience is the governor and the legislator. The report does go to DCYF first, um, and then it is disseminated to the governor and the legislator, but that's the audience. I would then, even with that, those um, communities as an audience, um, 
write some analysis briefly on why wage equity is important. Like for example, oh, like in Snohomish, um, we have we have empty slots because we um, are we are unable to find educators who can afford to um, work as an early learning educator because of wage inequity. And so the you know the direct impact to families and communities when um, wages are still low in various areas around the state. Thank you. See, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble seeing the raising hand and the my screen. So I got the hand. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Uh, Debbie, it looks like you have your hand raised. Uh, apologies, I forgot to lower it. I think I saw another hand, but it went away. It was Senator Wilson. I was just going to say, just FYI, Debbie, there is a budget proviso to um, that just came through. That was something that, uh, Nicole, I don't think that we mentioned, but around pulling all the different models together and the folks that have been part of the um, Child Care Collaborative Task Force and the and design uh, group that was happening through Child Care Aware and Child Care Resources and um, to actually uh, come together as a group to kind of put forth what that compensation package is going to look like. Just saying, um, and I see Nicole popping on, but clearly uh, totally so important. And I'm just going to stick my nose in and say the reason we passed for me, 5225 uh, to pay for the cost of care for employees in child care and the health care issues and the licensing um, and the background check piece was while we were coming up with a compensation package. What else could we do that would actually increase disposable income back in the hands of providers while we were creating the other piece, which we know is has to happen, as you said. So um, I'll shut up. So, but that is something that with the governor um, is in the budget and uh, that will be moving forward over this uh, short session. So just an FYI. Kathy? Hi, so this is a minor thing, but Senator Wilson reminded me of the um, the, the 5225 bill that was so critical for our child care staff and that the copay calculation tables that have to do with SMI differ between ECAP and the working connections. And I don't know, no one's been able to answer for me why they differ. What are they looking at different years? Uh, we had staff looking at the ECAP um, copay table that came out, or not copay, calculation table to see if they're eligible, that came out in February, thinking that they would qualify and then found the working connections one that comes came out in April saying, huh, maybe they won't qualify because it's different and the working connections one is less. So I'm just wondering if we should, could streamline that somehow, make it where that all of the, <clears throat> the statement of incomes that we're looking at for calculations for whatever we're looking at, they're the same. And Emily, if we can update, it's it's not the co-pays, it's the income eligibility, Kathy. Income eligibility, yeah, but I was looking at the co-pay chart, thank you. Because we've, and we'll, we'll go back and look at that and, Right now, they are at different income eligibility levels. So for ECAP, it can be it's 36% state median income and working connections is up to 60% state median income. And so I'm wondering if that is the basis for the difference, but we can take a look at those. Yeah, but if you compare them side by side, the percentages that are the same that show on both tables, they are different amounts. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy and Rika. Do you have your hand raised? Yes, thank you, Eric. Um, just wanted to expand on something that um, Debbie um, was um, sharing um, in her response. Um, you know, given that this is uh, the audience of this report are governors and legislators, um, what I think would be really helpful is to make sure throughout the report that we're giving um, you know snapshots or concrete examples of what does 
all of this look like on the ground? Um, you know, so, you know, giving really specific examples, highlighting what, not only what are the issues that are happening on the ground in different parts of Washington state, but also highlighting, you know, are, are some of these strategies working? Why are they working in some areas? Why aren't they working in others? Um, just so that, you know, you're getting a real true picture of, of, of the work versus, um, versus staying at a very high level. Thank you, Enrica. Is there anything that comes to mind about additional information that you need to be able to to develop these recommendations? I know at the last meeting, um, it was mentioned that you guys want to see, you know, you need some information on where DCYF is on some of these strategies. Nicole shared a little bit about that today. Eric and I are working to get you guys some more updates so that uh, we'll either come via writing in between meetings or um, potentially at the next report development meeting. But is there any anything else that comes to mind? I also meant to add at the beginning of this section that we definitely understand that this is a short turnaround for this for first report and that it might not be all encompassing of everything you guys want to recommend, but this is an annual report. Um, so it, the, the legislation says beginning August 31st, 2022 and annually. So this will be the first one. And then, you know, September 1st, 2023, we can already start working on um, the, the next report. So this definitely doesn't have to be um, all encompassing. I don't want anybody to feel rushed, even though I know it is kind of a, a rushed timeline. I see from Michelle sharing real stories illustrating how these changes have positively impacted providers, children, and families. Thank you, Michelle. I'm putting those um, kind of in the middle in yellow since they're not exactly recommendations, but more how you guys want the report to be structured. Um, if I'm getting anything wrong, please interrupt me and I will fix it. During Nicole's presentation, she made reference to something that I took note of, uh, where she she talked about how how do you want child care to look like in the future. So as I thought about that question and I thought of the the presentation and then the opportunity to actually get into recommendations, um, I wanted to ask the group or anyone that would like to share. Um, it's a very open ended question. I think it can go a hundred different ways, but if anyone would like to share. Um, what they would like to see childcare look like in the future. Lois. Lois. <laughs> so the one thing that I think about, if we talk about what we want child care to look like in the future, one would be more funded mandates as opposed to unfunded. That's number one. Number two would be um, assistance for programs whether they are private or with the majority private or um, working connections families, because 
you know, at the end of the day, and I'm, yes, I am, I'm thinking about my center because we, our neighborhood transitioned. So our children transitioned as um, fa families that were low income could no longer afford to stay in the neighborhood, whether it's rents or grandmother's house got sold or whatever the case may be. So your clientele changes, but, you know, we're, it's still a center that's in need of help. And I can think of several other centers that have that same issue that are in gentrified neighborhoods. So moving from just, oh, we need to help centers that are predominantly um, working connections children to being able to find a way to support all centers because at the end of the day, it's all of our children. And, um, and they all need to be able to have access to quality care. That was very well said. Thank you, Lois. And if I may add, you know, staff still deserve a, a thriving wage. There's this assumption that because I'm thinking of even centers on the east side, um, they may end up charging more, but staff still may not receive a thriving wage because, you know, rent might be higher, property taxes might be higher. There are so many other things that go into running a small business that that's more than just looking at a per child um, a, amount, which is the way a lot of people are like, oh, you charge this much per child, but they don't think about our insurance doubling or tripling or property taxes or uh, being able our healthcare benefit costs going up or L and I and I could go on and on and I see you know I see some folk nodding so I just want to just point that out. Thanks, Lois. Debbie. On on those lines, um, I I would definitely like to see a um a living uh, a workforce that receives a living wage and that receives um professional development opportunities that are accessible and affordable um i would like to um also see more integration with families on what is early learning, um, what does it look like, why is it important um, that education to be accessible really to all human beings, whether they have children or not, um, but understanding what it is. Um, and uh, a a more integrated um, connection and alignment between DCYF and OSPI around the continuation of education of children from zero, zero to five to K through 12. Um, and really encouraging these two educational systems to collaborate. more. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. Lois, did you have something else? I just wanted to have Debbie's permission to see if we can change that from living to thriving, because when I think of a living wage, I think about just simply being able to buy food and pay your rent. But I would love a thriving wage means that you might be able to take your children on vacation you know, and do some of the other things that make for um, an, uh, a well-rounded family life. So if, with Debbie's permission, if we could. Absolutely, thank you. I love it.
Okay, I want to go back to um, the concrete examples of what the impacts of FSKA look like on the ground in Washington State. Do, does anybody have any suggestions? Obviously we can gather you know, data from our internal sources, but does anybody have any suggestions or thoughts about um, where these examples will come from? Like, are, are you, do you envision you guys as providers or learning professionals bringing some examples or is that something that you um, would like community engagement staff to work on in between meetings? We can also always ask uh, the parent advisory group if they have any um, any input. Okay. Emily, I would just say as a as a legislator, uh, providers are pretty connected in at least their voices and stories they brought to the legislature related to bills, and whether that's through um, individual groups or whether that's through the Washington, you know, the child care group. Um, Lois, you know, there's, a, so I don't know, I, I believe there's a um, quite an active uh, group of stakeholders I know that were engaged and have been engaged. So um, I, I think, I mean, that's the most important thing is stories. I think they've done a great job at doing that and we need to continue to do that because I think in committee is the only place that you hear the stories, right? So mm -hmm. as a committee, um, there have been wonderful stories that have been brought forward, good, bad, or indifferent about the impact legislation has had. And I think um, this would then bring those same stories up to a much broader audience to read the full legislature as opposed to just committee members who hear those things. But Lois, I mean, I think, do you not agree? It, it's really putting a word out in the provider network and also um, parents would be the other piece, parent ambassadors. There's lots of different parenting group that um, have been engaged in this that I think would also give voice. So it's just, uh, yeah. Thank you, Senator Wilson. Yes, I do agree. And I also think um, another group too would be Child Care Aware Washington as they're doing their work around, totally. um, yeah. around wage, um, worthy, worthy wage efforts and that type of thing. And so as they're building their coalition, um, they received money from Balmer and some other foundations to do this work. So they would be a great group to partner with. So thank you, Senator Wilson. Thank you both. Enrica? Yes, just um, adding to, to this, I also um, think that, um, you know, like uh, Washington Communities for Children um, or, or going through coalitions um, can also um, be a way to um, get um, get voice um, and um, get uh, on the ground perspective. Thank you, Enrica. Are there any other thoughts around that? Head Start ECAP Association too would be a great for parent voice and uh, just thinking about uh, comprehensive pre-K programs as well as our um, child care and state funded because many of them are kind of blended um, and land in both of those kind of worlds. So another group, especially parent voice. Thank you. So also thinking like Imagine and Voices of Tomorrow uh, would be some other good ones as well as, you know, of course I'd imagine 925 is automatically on there, but I'm just thinking about the great work the family um, child care providers did on making their voices heard about the HOA bill that was passed. Um, so that would be uh, another group. Thank you. And I see Michelle's suggestion in the chat to share a survey link on social media for folks to submit their stories. It's a great idea.
we can always come back as as ideas pop up too but while there's a little um gap do you guys have any input on how you would like to spend the next couple meetings so um we have we have today until noon so a little over an hour left may we have um is it an hour of the june meeting is that right eric yeah Yep. Okay. We have an hour of the June ELAC meeting for the executive session, which we'll be working on this report development. Um, we have three hours in July and then one hour in August, and then the report will be due the end of August. So we really only have uh, four meetings left, and two of those are only an hour long. Um, so I'm curious if uh you would like, with the work that Eric and I are going to do to get you guys some information on where ELAC is on, or I'm sorry, where DCYF is on um, certain FSKA efforts, would you like us to look into bringing, um, bringing program staff to present at any of these meetings, or do you want the information to come in a written form? I kind of didn't word that that well, so let me know if you want me to explain that better. I guess I'm just trying to figure out where how we can best use the time together do you want to hear some information from dcyf and then um brainstorm and do the report development or would you rather the information uh moving forward come in a written form i see debbie's comment in the chat washington communities for children as a thriving statewide network of early learning sector professionals as well as parents and we have a child care statewide network that also worked heavily on hb 1199 so debbie that's another resource to tap into for stories and yeah okay great thank you I can tell you on our end, we were kind of thinking for the meetings where we only have an hour that we would definitely just do report development, um, but maybe at our July meeting, we could have some more program staff come and, and speak to anything that is a little more in the weeds than um, what Eric and I could explain. Does that sound okay? We want this to be your guys' report, so I don't want you to feel. Yeah, I see some thumbs up. Okay. So for the hour meetings, we'll just do some report development, but then when we have a little bit longer, we might be able to bring in some um, DCYF staff to go a little more in depth. Kathy, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm thinking that maybe I need some clarification on one part of the Fair Start for Kids Act. Mm -hmm. It's section 312, and it is about the negotiated rulemaking with child care centers. And the one liner that concerns me is that it states when the secretary elects to engage in negotiated rulemaking pursuant to the RCW that's attached to that. And I, I guess as a child care center owner and responsibility to share what the needs seem to be across the state, I feel like that that requirement to be more like required as opposed to when he elects or, or when someone when the secretary elects to negotiate with about rule making changes because this past year there were some things that were rules that were changed and yes it went through the official proper process it was disclosed it was shared in emails for those that received the emails. Um, it wasn't noticed because of the timing of it by a lot of people. And then all of a sudden there's a rule that impacts people where we would have wanted to maybe share and have some discussion prior to it being fully enforced. So I guess I'm wanting to know, I don't know if, if Senator Wilson can clarify, was the intent of, of that section 
to actually create more dialogue in advance of rulemaking and to try to, to, to make stakeholders be involved in the process in advance? Was that the intent? I think the, the intent is to say that rulemaking, you know, I, I don't think you want rulemaking around every single thing. So I'm not going to be able to answer legislatively what is an operational piece because legislatively rulemaking is a, is something that has to happen. But I look at it kind of the nexus of, uh, I look at it in an hourglass, right? And I am responsible for the legislation and the pieces above. And then when we think about the secretary or whoever's in charge of the agency, the purview from them is the agency below. And my um, my piece as a legislator is to ask and to to get feedback on implementation and how things move forward. Um, so I can tell you the and in, in, for me intent always is to have voice, um, but how that happens or um, whether you know, I, mean, I, I think that's a conversation. I think that's an ongoing conversation, but that's really operational more than it is um, legislative. So if they're um, because again, a requirement would be for every single thing, um, every single thing you would have to do that. And that I don't think is the intent either. So I don't know, Kathy, if that gives you an answer. I think it's also to just around um, the fact of who or who uh, an agency represent and uh, represents and how many voices it has to take into account when they're making decisions. So because you have the conversation and you have input doesn't always mean also that things move the, that direction, as you well know, um, the direction sometimes we want it to go. But I think, um, you know, the question is, is there opportunity for input and how does that look? And then how is that input um, utilized? So um, and that's something, again, I'm new enough to where I am still just getting solid on my role. and. Um, and I am not a, um, I'm not a user of the system. And so I know that there's that lens there as well. And we could talk more about it. I'd love to do that. But, um, you know, intent always is that uh, lived experience and voice needs to play a role in how things move forward and how things play out um, as much as can be done. Thank you. For and that. Nicole may have something totally separate to say. Thank you for that clarification. I guess in my mind, if there's a whole new whack being established around this topic, that that would, should, I would think, promote that dialogue to occur or start that dialogue in advance yeah. of public I, hearings. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and I guess, and, and again, I need to learn too about uh, where is the, where does it, where is that space? Mm -hmm. Where, where does that happen? And um, I would agree with you, you don't change a whole bunch of things without getting that input. Um, but I don't know what the nexus is and where that is and what creates that lever that says it's now, uh, you know, public meeting for um, rulemaking dialogue. And that's a learning piece for me as well. Yeah. I'll dig some more. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Kathy, I just wanted to let you know, I, I heard that and that we are um, talking about just our rules process overall at the agency and negotiated rulemaking and even thinking about it beyond early learning. And so took all of that in and um, certainly hear the desire there and uh, we'll work with Eric and team to provide an update on where we're at with that process when we have it. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, we still have about an hour left. Um, based off of what I've seen so far between today and uh, the next time we meet, so the June ELAC meeting, I'm not 
that I don't have the data off the top of my head. Um, we will, the community engagement team, we can do some reaching out to uh, these groups that you talked of, that you shared for parent input. Um, we have a we have a PAG meeting in May and then not again till July. So we can bring it up at the July meeting because um, our, our May meeting, the agenda is set. Um, so we'll reach out to these groups. We can look into doing a survey for social media to start collecting survey or uh, stories. Are there any other, uh, other than what's been shared, are there any other steps that you would like us, the community engagement team, to take before we gather next to work on this? Yes, Enrica. Thank you. I was just actually thinking of another group um, that you might consider reaching out to. And I'm thinking about the um, State Interagency Coordinating Council, the SICC. And what I'm thinking about is trying to get um, voices um, of families who have children with disabilities, developmental delays, um, uh, healthcare needs, um, and hearing about um, you know their experiences if they're trying to, for example, access um, you know child you know childcare, um, uh, and um, how have these um, the um, you know what we're trying to put in place? How has that been? Um, what's been their experience um, they're on. So getting the voices um, in that way. Um, and so, you know, going through SICC, um, thinking about um, early support agencies also referred to as early intervention. Um, yes, thank you, Senator um, Wilson for that um, as well. So just trying to make sure that we are not um, missing um, the voices of families that have children with uh, developmental delays, disabilities in our processes. Thank you, Enrica. That's a good call out. Open doors for multicultural families. Thank you. Would you, if we, um, I guess the survey would probably just be, you know, a kind of simple questions about parent experience, but is that something that you would like us to send out to this group before we post it to social media or um, reach out to these groups? I just wanna check in on how, um, involved you guys want to be on the front end of that uh reaching out what is your timeline on posting it to social media uh they can be posted to social media pretty quickly the longer timeline would be um us creating the survey so kind of like the you know the the back end work um and looking into if we needed to do any um translation that delays things, but uh, we our process. We're getting things posted to social media as we reach out to our um, our communications consultant, and they can have it posted within a couple of days. So um, we we likely, if we get moving on it, could have at least some uh, report backs ready at the June meeting. Depending on, I don't want to make any promises on that, but it, it's not a it's not a long process unless uh, we are getting um, translation. So for some of some of these groups, we might want to look into doing that. Do you actually maybe I should just ask that to you guys? What languages would you like us to put the service the survey out in on social media? I can tell you we use SurveyMonkey, and so uh, we would how how it works. You can't just like if someone's using Google Chrome, I don't know if you guys are familiar, you can change your language on Google Chrome, but that's not a perfect uh, at all. So what we would do is with SurveyMonkey, we would create different surveys for each language and we would go through um, our contractor to have that, the survey inter interpreted. So that that's where the process can kind of take longer. Um, but obviously, you know, we want to be inclusive too. So how do you guys feel about that? 
there any suggestions on what languages you'd like to see the survey come out in? I'm wondering if we could use data and um, actually look at the populations we're wanting to reach out and see what the top languages are. And I know uh, DCYF has, um, you know, again, kind of uses a, a, a think when they're kind of deciding what the what the top languages are. You certainly can't do all, but again, that's why it would be helpful too to reach out because some of these could be done in a, in a group setting too if groups got together. That's the other thing I'm thinking, but I, I think, um, so Spanish and Somali, and I know um, you're going to get some, but not all. So you really depends on, depends on who we're wanting to get voice from, I think also. Is it really only two languages, Eric, that most things happen? Uh, for just a general, for general messages, typically. Okay. Um, however, yeah. a lot of the grant work, when when we're really looking at at reaching a, a much more inclusive audience, um, they'll actually translate into. I think it's a total of six languages. Yeah, that's what and, I'm, six to eight or something yes, like yes. that. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, each of those um, are are definitely options, right? Um, it's not necessarily just specific to the the typical ones that they might send out for some messages, um, but we do have the opportunity to really reach just about any any language or break any language barrier. Um, and I think it's a good idea to use some data as well. And I think we've got some dashboards that we could possibly access to to pull a little bit of this and um, maybe try to be a little more targeted with with the survey. Oh, thank you, Michelle. That's right, Russian, that was the one I was missing too. I knew Mandarin, and I believe Arabic, and um, that might be it. That might be the six. Most common. I think Korean also oftentimes, it just depends yeah. on communities, so yeah. I think this is also where Imagine Institute can be helpful, especially as we're thinking about access to providers and the work they've been doing in the technical assistance realm, um, especially as we think about language access. So they also um, would be a place in a space that might be able to give resource already um, in the early learning child care space. Just thinking about that. I have another uh, open-ended question that I'd like to ask you all. Using Nicole's presentation as a starting point, which again, is just updates on all the great work that's been done. Are there any specific FSKA initiatives that you would like to see supported in the next supplemental budget? or I should say further supported. If it's helpful, we can also bring up any portion of her presentation back for you guys. And I do see Michelle's question, does it have to be SurveyMonkey? Microsoft Forms has a multilingual feature. Um, I can look into if we, I mean, we use Microsoft Office, so I would imagine Microsoft Forms is something that we, uh, could also access, to, to be honest, I don't know for sure. We just typically in community engagement have used SurveyMonkey, but I will look into that, Michelle. Eric, can you restate your question, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any specific FSK initiatives that you would like to see further supported in the supplemental budget, which of course will be the next session will be focused on the supplemental budget, um, looking at supporting programs that are uh, currently 
in operation. So, you know, looking at whether it's grant funding or um, dual language support, um, trauma-informed care. I mean, you know, there's just so, there was so much there. I wondered if maybe anything stood out that you'd like to see further support in that supplemental budget for? Yes, please, Senator Wilson. Okay, I'm just gonna put myself right out here um, <laughs> because I'm gonna put out a wonder and you can tell me whether I'm like crazy or not. Um, but this last session, we had quite a uh, quite a conversation around transitional kindergarten, which has come up in none of these conversations, which is just fine by me, um, related to early learning and the concern of um, really the impact that transitional kindergarten programs may have on the child care and on the workforce. And, um, and we also know not everybody is eligible, right, for uh, subsidy or for our state or federally funded programs. We also know that when we lose pre-K kids, we lose money because infants and toddlers do not uh, come even close um, to giving providers the cost of what it costs to really care for them, especially as we think about ratios. So as we move forward and as we're thinking transitional kindergarten and stuff, I'm just wondering, would somebody else besides myself be interested in moving ahead on let's do something around the infant toddler space? Um, when we think about so, when we think about rates and care, so that we don't have this fight, um, which we should never have, around um, having kids be in a place in a space because it's the only way we can afford to run a program, and that's not how we live our world. And I know that, but it sometimes it's starting to feel right now we're in this place where money has become the issue, which should never be. And so while we're thinking about a mixed delivery system and while we're thinking about serving as many kids as we can, um, would it be uh, an area to really dig in on and supplementally at least to begin to start looking at increasing um, the cost um, for providers to care for that um, you know, birth to three population? Just to wonder. I see Lois. Oh, uh, Senator Wilson, I'm I'm sitting here smiling because that just makes too much sense. But yes, yes, I think that that would be a wonderful idea. And and you've been around, you've seen the shift. You remember when there was a time we were fo focused on infant from birth to three, and then it shifted again, and we keep shifting back and forth instead of looking at funding on the whole um, uh, continuum from birth to. Um, grade three or 12, right, depending upon right. who you're talking to. Yeah. So I would definitely love to be a part of that conversation. You know, we I'm have sure the cap gains too. tax. You know, we have the cap gains tax now, and that's going to bring in 500 million a year when we think about um, additional investments. And so it's a time where we may have a you know resource which we've never had before. And now that that's been settled, you know, we can start thinking about these other things. And while we're looking at compensation, I just think that's a place where we could start really um, just starting somewhere and um, um, trying to increase again the dollars coming in. So, um, okay, that was, if Lois says yes, then I know I'm headed the right direction. So, and we've done this when we went from full day K Part day K to full day K when we went from, you know, all those things have been changes in our system that have impacted early learning, but we've been able to work through them. And I think this is another place in space where we can um, do that. And now we have some resource. I would add to that um, in incentives um, and I can only speak on the um, on the local level. Um, funding incentives, more opportunities and developing more opportunities for local school districts and early learning communities to communicate more 
from an educator perspective, but also on outreach and um, in a collaborative form so that what's already been alluded to, two educational and two, two communities that are serving families and children that really have families and children at the core of their values um, are being supported to work alongside each other um, for the similar goals I think that they have. Um, and knowing that funding is also precarious in the K through 12 educational sector that there's we are, we're really intentionally creating more opportunity um, particularly at the local level for that type of collaboration um, that I can only speak from my own from just like in Snohomish that we're really trying as this as a coalition we're really working that's one of our goals is to um, is to support that type of collaboration. And W referring to DCYF and OSPI, or did I? Yes, DCYF and OSPI, but how that manifests also at the local level. How can the statewide entities encourage that local um, collaboration and dialogue? They're, Between they're, the school district and child yeah, care. Okay. Right. I'm, I'm trying uh, to bring in, I'm trying to bring in grounded. Um, examples of what that looks like as well. I put in the chat that inside Fair Start for Kids Act is a pot of money for ESD early learning coordinators that were doing just that cross-system sector work and also adding now in the transitional kindergarten coordinators that also are at the nine ESDs as, as conveners, if you will. And that was not, uh, I was not able to get that bucket funded this session, but that is Coming back, um, I'm going to go for it again in the supplemental, just again as we're adding transitional kindergarten to do exactly that, Debbie, and uh, across the state in um, the nine kind of regional areas that also serve our child care providers, child care aware, and is in um, seven out of the nine ESDs is within those um, ESDs. And so the work makes sense, and it really is that cross-system sector work. So. Um, and so take a peek at that and we can talk more because there may be more we need to do um, with that to support local programs. Thank you, because I know our our ESD coordinator has a very large area to cover. <laughs> so we're really trying to work alongside her and, and support the work. Thank you. I wonder how you guys would feel about maybe developing some survey questions together um, with some of the time that we have left. If recommendations or questions come back up, we can always go back to that. Does anybody have any um, initial ideas on the types of questions? I guess it it will depend. I'm just thinking out loud here too, so I apologize if I'm hard to follow. Um, so some of the audiences that we're trying to reach are parents, some are providers, so I think the questions will probably depend on who the audience is. Uh, but are there any specific questions or ways to to ask the questions that that you guys have in mind? We're always happy to, you know, just like develop it on our end and send it out to you guys too for review, just keeping in mind that that also kind of elongates the timeline. Um, thanks, Senator Wilson. If there are any thoughts on that, we can definitely come up with some questions and, and share them. Um, just thought maybe with some of the, with the 45 minutes we have left, we might jump on that. I have a question that's 
but I've also been pondering, um, and maybe other um, ELAC people might have an, some thoughts on this, but part of, part, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is capacity towards towards leaders around the state that are doing this advocacy work and have the time to do this work, to really think from a systems perspective that's also on the ground, which I think many ELAC um, uh, leaders are, but how are we supporting that infrastructure where there really is that local voice that um, and that people are getting compensated to be at these tables. Um, I just don't, I think, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. If people have thoughts, like what's be, like how can that be more supported so that there are represent representative voices of various different experiences really being at these decision-making tables. Thank you, Debbie. Um, it's not uh, directly related to FSKA, but I think it might be a little uh, related to your question. There is um, the lived experience stipend, and is that what you were going to say, Eric? Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, it, you might want to take that over. Yeah. I, don't I was actually going to ask it. if Erin was still there, if she wanted okay. to maybe, maybe describe it a little further, just so we don't get it, you know, confused. But if not, I can probably give a, a quick overview there. Um, we're looking at creating some guidelines and processes for um, creating stipends for lived experiences. So we've been working with Department of Commerce and there's a couple other resources that you know has these opportunities out there. And I, I believe it's um, one of DCYF's priorities in, in identifying this particular process and then making sure that we do just what you're describing, where we, we want to make sure that everyone has a seat at the table and, and those that are there are properly being compensated for that lived experience in bringing their voice to the conversation. So um, yes, there's work being done, but in terms of specifics or um, timelines, I, I'm not real sure on that, but we could definitely follow up with that. That's something I think that we could come back to. That's great. I, I saw that piece of legislation pass. So that's something that's funding that's coming out of the Department of Commerce that entities can apply to. Yep. Okay, got yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you bet. Yeah, and Chelsea Thompson, who is on our community engagement team, has actually done a ton of work on that. So we can definitely get you some more information. Eric and I have been a little more distance from it. So I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything wrong, but Chelsea's very knowledgeable about it. So we'll connect with her and we can get you guys some info on that too. Cause yeah, that is very important. Some stuff in the chat. Thank you, Enrica. Well, I also don't want to, um, you know, keep you guys here till twelve if there aren't enough. If we if we don't have uh, enough to say right now, but willing to hold the space too, because you know I know that we don't have a ton of time for this. But I think on our team, we definitely have some action items that we can work on and some stuff to get you guys. Is there anything additional anybody wants to say? Any questions, any info you'd like us to track down? Okay, well then maybe we can give you guys some of, some of your day back and we can get a jump start on looking into some of these action items. I'm still staring, sharing my screen. Sharing. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. I know that you're constantly getting meeting requests and constantly being asked for your feedback and input, but we really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to do this work for children and families in Washington. 
Right. Well, we will be sending out a follow up email um, either end of this week or early next week. Uh, and we'll start working on some of these things. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a good rest of your week.